Today, I'm speaking with Dr. George Bonanno. He's professor of psychology, chair of the Department of Counseling and Clinical Psychology, and director of the Loss, Trauma, and Emotion Lab at Teachers College, Columbia University. He's the author of The Other Side of Sadness, and more recently, The End of Trauma, How the New Science of Resilience is Changing How We Think About PTSD. Dr. Bonanno, thank you so much for being with me. Oh, my pleasure, Zach. It's nice to be here. Congratulations, by the way, on the publication of your latest book, The End of Trauma. Um, Thank you. As you know, I'd love to center our conversation around it and try to make sense of what you've established in your research and um, that you've had to fight against to get there. So I I guess I could start by asking, maybe it didn't come through in the book. Maybe there are things that that I don't know about your prologue and certainly some listeners. So I'd love to get a little bit of background and and I'd love to know also um, whether research on trauma, resilience, um, bereavement is something that you sought after or something that you, fa- you know, happened upon or, or whether it found you? Um, that's a great question, Zach. It actually um, did kind of find me in a strange way. I had finished my PhD back in 1991 and I was trained in experimental research Um, but I was also trained in clinical psychology and I wanted to do something. I felt like I needed to shift gears a little bit and do something a little bit more in line with my clinical training. So I was offered a position at that time in San Francisco at the university there, a very great university, University of California, San Francisco, but it was to study bereavement. And I wasn't keen on it at, at first. I thought, well, what is bereavement? I don't know about bereavement. And I didn't know much about it. And so but then I went out to, to interview and to meet people and I realized and look into the literature and I realized we don't know much about this. The literature that we have, what we knew about bereavement, the expert ideas seemed really out of date to me, seemed woefully out of date compared to what I knew about psychology. So then I got in, intrigued and I took the job and we began to um, basically apply more, I says, more contemporary research methodologies. And one of the things we did was that at the time, both grief and trauma or loss and trauma was focused on only on pathology, on complicated prolonged grief and on PTSD. And those are extremely important things to understand and to treat and to learn about, but it's only a piece of the picture. And we can't actually understand those kind of reactions if you don't understand the full spectrum of how people Mm -hmm. react, don't understand how people are healthy. So we just all we simply did is set out to design a study to look at that. What do other people do? And we, you know, recruited lots of different types of people. Anybody, in fact, who'd been through a loss or a trauma, we recruited them into our studies and followed them over time. And right away, we began to see resilience. We didn't even call it resilience yet, but we thought that's was we saw that right away. So in that sense. It found me. I wasn't exactly sure I would find that. And we found it and said, wow, that's really interesting. And we, we, you know, we, we were interviewing people and we were being with people. So it was palpable. These people are quite resilient. They're suffering. You know, people suffer when they're, you ask them to talk about it, but they were functioning, getting by, and they were doing what they needed to do in life. And they were living actually healthy lives. So we did another study. We found the same thing in another study and another study. And that's been the story for the last 30 years. Literally every study we do, we've seen that the majority of people actually show this resilient response. But this was not, so in a sense, it found me, but then we continued to look for it after that. I'm going to bring people in here um, to something familiar. I work in the addiction field and I work, my close colleague is Dr. Stanton Peel. And he's been pointing to this forever, but I think we could also point to um, Sally Sattel, a, a colleague and friend, and her mm-hmm. co-author, Scott O'Lillienfeld, um, who wrote the book Brainwash. And they had this beautiful passage showing that for decades, there's been research about addiction and how people overcome it. And we look at that and it, it, there's just massive surveys are showing that by and large, the majority of people overcome addiction. And not only that, they overcome it on their own with no professional help. And so then you think about what's the standard model of addiction? Well, it's that it's a chronic relapsing brain disease that, you know, you, you have it, you kind of hold it over your head forever. And you'd say, well, what's up with that? And you see that, as you said, people are extrapolating from a minority sample of people who don't tend to recover from it or, or get, get away from it. Um, so therein lies a problem, but on one hand, the conventional model is extrapolating from a minority set of data. 
but also then you have the there's an awful notion associated with well this thing is forever that there's some line in the sand somewhere where there are people who are addicted who just will never get over it you know there's some sort of person yes. with an addiction who just can't overcome it and so you see uh, of course why i'm so interested in your work there's the parallel runs it, it's yes, so absolutely yeah yeah so and i think it, it's the same the same kind of issue uh in the example about addiction it's that when you focus only on those who don't recover those, those people need help but then you narrow your your window and i think the people that work in that field the same thing that the people who study trauma when you see only people who are traumatized and you see only people who are addicted you basically this is it's very human to begin to assume that that's more that to to exaggerate how prevalent that is in, in everybody else and there's actually good research that shows this it's a it's a because People who treat addiction, people who focus on PTSD, they're human. And humans make these fundamental errors. This one particularly is called the fallacy of the law of small numbers. You see a small group of people every day, they become the norm for, they become more the norm. We actually even did a study where we, um, uh, we did this a number of years ago, where we recruited about, I think about 300 um, uh, members of the American Psychological Association who were, who were therapists. And we gave them a survey. We asked them a lot of questions. The questions were, um, you know, how prevalent is trauma in the general population? How likely is it that people in the general population will need help from trauma, et cetera? And then we did one tricky thing. We had everybody think of their most traumatized patient. And then for half of those people, we asked, had them think about their most traumatized patient and ask, rate how traumatized their patient was, answer a few questions. We had them do that first. For the other half, we had them do that last. Turned out what we found is when people did that first, they answered the prevalence in the population as higher. Mm. And that was because they thought about their most traumatized patient and they and then extrapolated from there to the broader population. This person is so traumatized. Other people who experience these events must be traumatized more. And so they simply exaggerated it compared to the people who had answered it last. And that's a great uh, illustration of the fact that it's a kind of a simple extrapolation. It's a very human kind of, you know, bias that, that you know, and, and therapists and researchers are not immune from that. I loved in your book, you had, um, I, I thought actually this was brilliant. You had case studies where um, several people experienced the same type of trauma, at, like in 9-11, <coughs> uh, their responses to 9-11. And um, you kind of r run the reader through their experience that day. And then you pose a challenge. All right, which one? Which ones of these people uh, were had resilience enough to sort of kick that demon and and get beyond it in life? And the answer was, you're not going to get it. Um, and if yeah. you do, it's going to be by chance, and that you've already done a study on this. Um, so I, I thought that was sort of brilliant. That you can't pathologize. Um, there's really no data to illustrate what kind of person, even necessarily what kind of particular experience would cause a person uh, to have trauma for a long period of time versus somebody who, you know, they lock that in some some of their memory and then they just go on with a balanced life. Yeah, because it's all in what people do afterwards. And, you know, the events vary and people, sometimes people are, are, are confronted with more difficult things, but we've seen in our research, even the most difficult things, most people are still resilient to those things. Not everybody, and, you know, that's really important that some people suffer, but most people are. Um, I think the big problem in the trauma world is the word trauma. Mm. The, the word trauma is, you know, the, the PTSD diagnosis is, I don't know how familiar people are with the PTSD diagnosis, but it's the only real diagnosis in the, you know, the Bible, the DSM, the Bible of diagnosis, even in the international classification system. It's the only diagnosis that requires both having the symptoms of PTSD and also having been exposed to a potential, a traumatic event. So there's a criteria for what a traumatic event is. It's, it's generally violent, life-threatening, horrific experience, or maybe of the sexual violation nature. Those are the categories. You know, other things are not potentially, are not traumatic events. But the fact that that's called a traumatic event is the problem. Because for most of us, you know, most people, they hear this is a traumatic event. They think, well, then I'm traumatized, right? So 
But I, too, I use the word, as you even heard me make a few mistakes here, I use the word, potent, the phrase potentially traumatic event as much as I can. I try to force myself to use it. In fact, I did such a good job, I couldn't say traumatic event just now. Um, because these events, all of these events are potentially traumatic. No event, no event is traumatic. It's just a traumatic event. It's not in the event, it's in how we react to it. And, you know, there's a lot to that. It's not a simple thing, but the event itself doesn't guarantee you will be traumatized. But we have that idea in our head, partly because the word trauma and, you know, I think, you know, there's a lot of, there are books and ideas out there about hidden traumas, people are carrying around hidden traumas, and that is just plain wrong. Mm. What that, what's happening there is that most people, and this epidemiological data, you know, large scale studies have shown most people are exposed to at least one and often several events that would qualify in the DSM as a traumatic event. They're violent, life-threatening, et cetera. And most people are resilient to those events. So we forget them. We move on from them. I've been probably exposed, I know at least five that I can think of that are, that are pretty horrific things that I have mostly happened when I was younger and really stupid. I did a lot of really dumb things when I was younger. I got in a lot of trouble and I was exposed to great danger sometimes. But those events, I often for, I would forget about those events. The problem is then when we're reminded of those events, if we think of those as traumatic events, then we can easily one step to think, my God, that was a traumatic event. I must have been traumatized. I have a hidden trauma, which explains why, you know, I can't get the, the, what I want to do in life or why I, my, my relationship is not any good or why, you know, I don't have a better paying job or why I have anxiety right now. We, it, we, we kind of make this false connection. And, you know, of course, some events in our past are indeed generally traumatic. But those events we know about, we don't forget those kind of events. People do not forget, like in, events that cause enduring psychological harm, we remember those events. It's the events that didn't, we tend to forget them. And it leads to this very mistaken idea that's prevalent in, the, in our culture right now, at a societal level. We're talking about you know, trauma-informed interventions, which is assumes that everybody's got a hidden trauma in their past, or they probably do. And that's just plain wrong. It's not true. I have two tabs open in my mind right now. I, I think, what does conventional trauma theory say? I mean, is it, does it say something like, um, you know, if a traumatic event or if you've had sufficient traumatic experiences, then there is now something of a ceiling on your ability to live a fulfilling life? Or am I straw manning? Well, no, I mean, actually conventional trauma theory, if I don't know what that is exactly, but the DSM has been like the, this more conventional definition. The DSM is actually, I think, gets it right, mm -hmm. that we have these events, they define them very clearly as a violent or life-threatening type of event. There's very limited range for these events. The ICD, the, the European, the international classification system also has a similar diagnosis. Of this, of this nature. And they even specify the types of events. It's these examples are, are what we're talking about. And then they talk about the symptoms. People, go, people who go through these events still don't have a PTSD diagnosis unless they've had this whole range of symptoms for at least one month. They have a prolonged symptom reaction. That's actually reasonable. I mean, I have a lot of problems with diagnoses in general. I think they're not very scientific. And that's not a problem that we kind of pretend they are. They're not. But they're, mm -hmm. as, as societal tools, they're okay. And I think, so the, the conventional idea is that. It's really this how these ideas trickle out. And I, again, as I said, I think the big problem is that word traumatic event because it's a misnomer. And I mean, I would love to fix that. Now, I, I use the term potential traumatic event. I mean, that's not the best phrase in the world. You know, it, it's, it's a little bit of a mouthful. I mean, I haven't really bothered to think of anything better. There probably is something better I could use, like highly, highly aversive event or, you know, uh, you know, maybe an acronym. We use it actually in my research we, when we publish papers. And in, I don't think I did it in the book, but we call, we use PTE, potential traumatic event, the PTE. Mm. My lab and people that know my work use that now sometimes. But, you know, PTE, but that has no inherent meaning if you don't know the acronym. So, you know, but it's really the problem is that assuming with even the conventional ideas that were traumatic, but otherwise it's actually correct. So this is a cultural thing, like a rhetorical thing that trauma has made its way into the lexicon as to mean uh, something pathological 
And something that's going to make you traumatized. Yeah. Right. And you know, you can't control language. Language always has a life of its own. There's mm -hmm. no use even trying. So, you know, we can, we can suggest things, but language does what it wants to do, you know? Um, but, you know, I mean, there, there's, there's great research like where people have been followed, you know, since, uh, since early adulthood or late childhood for, you know, 10, 15 years as epidemiological studies have been done. Naomi Breslau is one of the researchers who do this. She's a great epidemiologist. And what this research, research shows is they actually track people repeatedly over time and they track the occurrence of these events. And what the, what the research shows is that if you have a bunch of these events over time, or at least some of these events, it doesn't necessarily mean you'll get PTSD. What predicts PTSD, if you have one of these events, and then you experience PTSD at the time, you experience a prolonged reaction, a prolonged, you know, um, uh, enduring trauma reaction after the event, then you're more likely to get PTSD in the future, you're more vulnerable. And there is also some work that's showing that there's possibly epigenetic changes, changes in how your genome works that make you a little bit more likely to, to be disposed a little bit more towards trauma um, in the future. Not, it's not absolute, it just increases the odds. But otherwise, ex being exposed to these events does not make you more vulnerable because they're, they're, they weren't a traumatic experience. Hmm. One of the ways I met Peel is that um, was at, a, at a conference and Gabor Mate was speaking there. I don't know if you're familiar with his work and um, wrote a book in the realm of hungry ghosts, I think it's called, about you know all addiction stems from trauma. And he does this exercise. I mean, first of all, he's a brilliant guy. He was saying some really common sense things about what addiction is and, and even some common sense things about what trauma is, what it means to have had a traumatic event in your life. Then he got to a point where he does this exercise. He asks people in the room, do you have an addiction, some sort of uh, disorder or uh, impairment in your life? And do you also think that it's not, the root cause is not trauma? And so some hands shot up. And then he says, well, do you mind if I do this little exercise with you? And he does this sort of Freudian psychoanalytic thing with the, with the participant and digs out the trauma. You know, you didn't know it, but this thing is affecting you. And I remember this is my first interaction with this kind of theory or thinking. I mean, he got a round of applause at the end. And I, I couldn't have been the only one sitting there thinking this is horrible. If this was a, a true clinical exercise, I mean, this is awful. You are now imposing uh, trauma on a person where it wasn't before. Yes. yes. So I'm, I'm curious what you think about what, you know, what down, downsides there are to having yeah. this uh, a clinical way of thinking about things. Well, I don't know this body of work. I don't know this individual. I've heard the name before, but I've never read this kind of an, a different realm of, of, of thinking that I normally, I mean, more, I don't think it's, a, I don't know who the, I don't know the work and know the, the concept name. is, I guess, more important than the. Than yes. The but, but often when I present in, you know, give public talks or talks at universities, somebody will be in the audience who might, might study another kind of problem like, like schizophrenia or um, depression or borderline, some you know behaviors, and they'll often say to me, you know, reputable researchers will say, but what do you think about the idea that these? But it seems that these people all have trauma in their past. And my response, my my answer is is a little bit simpler than that, but it's basically along the lines of what you just said. I say, well, everybody does. Everybody has these events in their past, and I think it's actually harmful. I think what you described sounds harmful to me. I don't, I don't know, you know, I'm going on your account, but it sounds very harmful to me because you're now telling a person you have been traumatized. And I know that it's very common in the mental health world to then say, you had one of these events, this must be your hidden trauma, your trauma you've repressed or something. None of those things are realistic. None of those things mirror how we actually function. Most people are exposed to these kinds of events without harm. And when someone is exposed to something, if they are traumatized, they do not forget it, right? They know about it. And that's really, that's what, that's an empirical reality. So I think it's harmful. I generally think it's harmful without getting into any particular person. Mm -hmm. I think it's harmful to, to label people's experience for them as a traumatic past or tra hidden trauma or a trauma in general. It's up to them to tell you what it was, you know, and, and I think it's very invasive. And it's probably really tempting to pull that, that trick of, I will now wave my wand and look into your past. I don't think that's healthy. It's uh, tautological, as you say. Um, but I should probably get, let you defend your research on resilience. Um, 
you something that I like that you did in the book was just like you there isn't a specific kind of individual you can't look at the genome and say well this person is going to you know if they experience a potentially traumatic event they're all using your language then they are going to you know that's it for them also it actually was kind of difficult to to pinpoint a type of person who could become resilient or who was better at becoming resilient so you list a you know a variety of of ways that people can uh, have flexibility in their mindset and i wonder if you could talk a little bit about that you know what yeah sure yeah so i mean the the first part of what you're describing is something i call the resilience paradox that we can identify all these different things and these traits that that are are actually in one way or another sort of correlational linked correlative correlative linked to resilience but they don't actually predict resilience my favorite example is that um Hot weather is correlated with um, with being with you know uh, physical assault and robbery, right? Mm-hmm. And that that makes sense when it's hot, people will get a little antsy. But that nobody would take that to mean you know it's it's ninety five degrees out. I better not go outside today because I'll be mugged. No one would think that, but that's because it's a correlation and it's a very small correlation. You know, if it's done on an entire population, an entire country. You're going to be like there's a reliable relation, but it's too small to actually, you know, have any immediate impact on you. A lot of the things that we associate with resilience are the same way. They have a very small relationship. They're in, in you know, the research are shown to be statistically significant, but that can be a tiny effect. So knowing the traits a person have, they, these are there's nothing, they're not pointless, these traits, but they're they're tools. So, you know, being optimistic having social support, you know, in your life, having economic resources, you know, um, having um, good genetic background, you know, for, for, for health, um, you know, having, um, uh, being in a stable marriage, being, um, you know, I don't know, there are a whole list of things that you can think of. They're all good tools to have at your disposal, but they won't make a person resilience. Resilience will come about at the time afterwards the event when a person will then kind of dig in and deal with whatever's happened to them. And that's what I've been calling flexibility, just a kind of a broad term for the process that we engage in. And I've been studying this process in, the, in my research for a number of years before I finally realized this is how people do it. You know, I didn't think of the idea and then, and then propose it. I, I found it empirically and then, oh, this is how it works. And I, I you know, I, I'm, I'm putting my money on it. You know, I could be wrong. I've been wrong before about things, but this really seems to capture it. And it has two parts that I've been able to put together so far. And I, you know, it's, it's could be more complicated, could be less complicated. But the first part is just a way of thinking. It's an attitude. I call it a mindset where we just basically think it's really involves optimism, um, being confident about the tools we have and, um, and focusing on the challenge, being willing to do that. It's called challenge appraisal. You know, you think the kind of a, what do I need to do here attitude? And those things kind of work together to form this mindset. They don't, they can be other ways to do it. But these, these attitudes kind of get us in the game. I like to put it that way. They get us on the playing field they, or they get us in the kitchen. You know, we just went through Thanksgiving, lots of cooking. Over, you know, you have to get in that kitchen and do it so that we need a little motivation to get in there and do it. And that's a little bit like what these, these attitudes do for really probably for, for cooking the Thanksgiving meal or getting on the playing field on a rainy day against a team that's going to cream you. You know, you need to have a little bit of a, that, that motivation to do it. And we need that to cope with adversity also. Um, we need, and, you know, there's, as I said, it, it doesn't have to be this way anyway. You can do it. I, I, I recently did a, a podcast with Joe DeSena, who has a, a podcast called um, Spartan Up, which I really enjoyed. He does this obstacle race, which, you know, you, mm-hmm. you, you people like climb up, you know, 30 foot walls and dive into ice cold water and then climb up a hill in the mud and a bunch of people nuts out there doing this and they get to the end. And most people who've never done it before think, well, I can't do that. I can't dive in cold water, you know, and I can't get up a muddy hill and I can't do all those things, but then they do it. And it's a great booster. You think, oh, I can do, I can do this. I can do just about anything. And we can do this in our own life. We can kind of just give ourselves a chance. Well, what if I try this? What'll happen? So that's one part of it. It's a sense of like, I, I could just, I can do this. It'll be okay. I can do this, this attitude, this conviction. 
and we can nurture that. And the other part is once we do that, once we get ourselves into the game, once we get ourselves on the field, in the kitchen, whatever we, you know, into the classroom, whatever we're, we're kind of need to do that's not so easy. Once we do that, then we just break it down and there, there's a whole nother set of tools we call the flexibility sequence. We sort of take stock of the situation, ask ourselves, what's happening here? What do, what, you know, what do I need to do? Then we then this is when we use those tools we have. We, we look at our repertoire. What would work here from what I can do? Depends on what you can do. So it does matter to have those tools in place, but then this is where you use them. And then there's a third part that's really important. I love this part called feedback monitoring. And we kind of you know, proposed this and ended the research on this. And we've now got good evidence for this that we ask ourselves, is this working what I just tried? Because no, nothing is gonna work the first time. And in fact, one of the, the whole reasons for this is that nothing does work every time. And there's an enormous amounts of evidence for that. Nothing is always good or always bad. Nothing is always effective, never not effective. Everything you know, depends on the situation. So I'm gonna try this thing that I always do. Oh, it's not working here. Instead of saying, well, then I'm screwed. And we think, okay, what else can I do? What else, what else are in my toolbox? You know, um, a, my favorite example is, is a plumber. I live in an apartment in New York, you know, and I call the plumber. He comes in, usually he, um, not, it doesn't have to be a male, could be a woman. The plumber comes in, looks at the situation, says, oh my God, that's a mess. Cause it's an old building I live in. That's a real mess. I'm not going to be able to do that. In fact, this just happened. The plumbers came in, they put a snake in my sink because it was clogged, you know, a snake to unclog a sink. And it broke off in the sink. It broke off in the pipes. It's, wow, these are old pipes. There's a prehistoric clog up in there somewhere. And they had to end up doing something else, get another tool out to pull it out, rip up the wall, all these things that they had to go back. The plumber can't say, well, sorry, you're screwed. I'll see you later. They've got to do their job. So they have to find another tool. And that's exactly what happens when we're coping with trauma. It's, do people have difficulty being resilient if they've been, I guess, shadowed from things that could be traumatic? Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I'm going to guess yes. But, but I mean, most people, you know, you can't, unless you really try, you can't hide from potentially traumatic events because they happen when you're least mm. expecting. You know, if you drive in an automobile, lots of people, most people drive in automobiles, Actually, I don't because I live in New York City. I don't have a car, but I'm on the subway. You know, I am in cars sometimes. You know, I, I, I rode my bicycle a lot during the pandemic. I was hit three times during the pandemic, right? But, you know, I can't predict that. I'm a careful person. Not really, but I'm, I try, you know. And so, I, you know, unless you're living a very sheltered life and you're afraid to move, it's going to happen to you sometime. But I, I mean, I do find it a little worrisome that um, we're moving in our culture more toward overprotection, mm. um, you know, toward kind of like being a everybody um, being afraid to let something happen. And even in our political discourse, we're, we're, we're reluctant to talk with someone who doesn't have the same views as us. And that's, you know, there's a lot of, of, of siloing going on right now. I don't think that's healthy because it does keep us from challenging ourselves. But I think most of the time, even with that, we, it's pretty hard to avoid it. There are things that happen. It's yeah, because you were you were talking about your flexibility, the flexibility sequence, and um, especially the last point, you know, where you revisit how is this going. It's um, sort of akin to, and I think you mentioned Carol Dweck's work. Um, yes, her, absolutely. Her book, her book mindset, and it seems, um, I guess, antithetical to a growth mindset to try to have things <laughs> fixed in place. Yes, um, or totally safe. So it, it's, it seems like it is reasonable to, to make that assumption. Yeah, and I think actually that's the danger of, you see a lot in the, in the media, the, the, the magic traits of resilience, the five traits of resilience or the three traits or books and media that, um, you know, making these claims, these are the, the five traits of highly resilient people. And it varies, right. it's three, right. five, eight, and that's already a tip off, there's something wrong here. Why is it three, five or eight? And but that's a dangerous idea because it gives people the assumption then that if I have these traits, then I'm good to go. And that's really what lead to what Carol Dweck would, Dweck, Carol Dweck would call a fixed mindset. And her research is brilliantly shows she was at Columbia for a while. And I love her research. She brilliantly showed that if you have a fixed mindset, it's fine until you fail. 
Mm. And if you fail, then you if you think I I have all the tr- I have all the goods, so therefore I'm good to go, or I'm an intelligent person, and I don't have to worry about these things. Until you fail at something, if you have a fixed mindset, you can only say, well, I must not be an intelligent person, or I must not be good to go. I'm I'm in terrible shape, right? Because you have no other choice. If you're believing that it's fixed and it doesn't work, then you don't have it. And, the, and that's where she came up with the idea of a growth mindset. It's not about having the right things in place. It's about trying and learning and trying and learning. And that's, I think, absolutely what, what happens when we're coping with potential trauma. So what do you do with this information? Or maybe you don't do anything necessarily, but how do you, how do you uh, propose that it be applied practically? Um, oh, that's a great question, Zach. And I do actually do things in my own life with this, you know, because as I develop these ideas, I think, oh, yeah. That works. I'm going to do that. And, you know, um, I I mean, I've actually applied it um, reluctantly in the last year. I had some pretty serious medical problems that happened to me and they were kind of depressing medical problems. And um, I got through them by just breaking it down to try things one at a time and get through each piece of it. And I think that, um, you know, we can apply these things in our in our everyday life. It doesn't have to be a potentially traumatic event. And in fact, a potentially traumatic event, it's hard to, it's hard to develop new skills when you're going through a potential trauma. It's much better, much more effective to try things out for everyday stressors. You know, and there are plenty of those. You know, you lose your keys. You miss this in New York. I missed the subway and I have to wait another 20 minutes or something, you know, or, you know, you miss an airplane or you didn't get what you wanted in the thing or you got a bill that you didn't expect or your children, you know, something happened to your children or something happened to your, your, your spouse or your partner or your, your parents. All these things constantly happen to us. You know, the pandemic just got extended and, now, you know, we don't know how, how long it's going to end. Now, that's another blow, right? We didn't expect that. So now we have to deal with it. We can apply these things in real time all the time. Practice them. There's one reason I wrote the book, actually, because I thought this should be out there. Our research has shown, actually, that most people actually do this already. They just don't know it. They don't, they don't, um, they don't know about the way they do things. It's somewhat what we learn as we grow up. And, you know, I think we can do better by understanding it and by learning it and by by um, by naming it and using it and, and thinking more consciously about it. Um, we can apply it more. And all the, the research about all these pieces also shows that they, they can be developed. So in the book, I propose self-talk, which is how you talk to yourself about it. Use a, you can just say, you know, give yourself little phrases. And I actually use those in my own life now. I only use them since I discovered that, that you can use that, that self-talk works. There's a great literature on self-talk. So for optimism, I might say, it's going to be okay. You know, it's going to be okay. Just like right now in the pandemic, you know, we've been, it, it, we, were, we were just as disturbed, even more disturbed at the beginning, quite disturbed at the beginning. We got through that. Then we got to the next thing and the next wave and the next thing that happened, the new variant shows up and, you know, all these things happen and we get through those things. And we're going to get through what we're going through now. So we tell ourselves, it'll be okay, you know, I have to, I have to get through it, I will, but it'll be okay. Or, we, or say the, the, um, the confidence in coping, you can tell yourself, I have tools, I've been through things, I know I can have lots of different tools, and we can kind of make a, what do we have in our disposal, what do we do? Do we talk to people easily, or do we, are we good at, you know, bearing down and, and just dealing with it, or are we good at kind of putting things aside when we need to, are we good at distracting ourselves when we need to? And people have done a lot of this during the pandemic. I think bad movies have never been watched so much in history, you know, people just watching bad movies because it's fun, it's entertaining, whatever, put it on, you know, and so we, we can practice these things and pay attention to them and notice that what we're doing and tell ourselves little phrases to remind ourselves. And, um, you know, the, with the sequence, the, the, I've actually listed some of these phrases in the book, what's happening to me, what do I need to do is for the, the sensitivity to the event, the repertoire is what am I able to do? And then the, the last thing is, is it working, right? We can ask ourselves these things. You know, the, there's a whole list of these things in the book, other examples, and, you know, um, and you can put your name in it. This is something Ethan Cross has done, this very interesting work, showing that if you, it's called distant self-talk. If you put your own name in the phrase, it's actually really powerful because it's like watching yourself from like a fly in the wall and it makes it work even better. So you might say, you know, um, I'll use my own. I might say, George, you can do this. Or George, what do you what, what do you have? What do you do? What's your, what, are, what can you do here? What do you what do you have in your toolbox? 
or George, is it working? You know, you can just do that yourself and it really kind of pulls you out of it and you're watching yourself ask that question. You're having a dialogue with yourself. So that's also very effective. There are lots of little things like that we can try. And I think just, you know, I, I really encourage people to read the book and, and, and take a look at it. And, you know, it, 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 some people may be skeptical, try it out in your own life. By the way, do you do the self-talk in your mind or do you do it out loud? Because uh, some people have thought I was crazy. I think both. <laughs> I'm, 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 a, I'm a great talker. I'm talking all the time, so I don't mind. I do actually say things out loud sometimes. <laughs> I also have the advantage of I live in an apartment building in New York City with an elevator. You can do a lot of stuff in those elevators. You know, you can talk to yourself, you know, you can, you know. And so, I mean, I, you know, I walk a lot too. You can, people are in a car. Yeah, you can, you can talk out loud, sure. Um, clinically speaking, you know, I'm thinking about people in the most dire circumstances and, you, you know, you mentioned a sampling bias among clinicians often, and they're working with people who are in distress and probably have some of the, you know, the worst outcomes that can be seen or else why would they be seeing the clinician? Um, and so, of course, I'm in favor of a roadmap that is just commonsensical away from trauma rather than pathologizing or necessarily diagnosing somebody's experience for them. I think there's an awful notion associated with, you know, telling people what their experience was. So that's, that's out for me. But is there a sensitivity that you have to have um, clinically to, um, to use this sort of a set these sets of roadmaps that you've sort of discovered help people out of trauma? In other words, I, I, I can imagine trying to rah, rah, rah person out of you know, some sort of a deep despair, even if it's just more basically than they have had a traumatic event that they just have a heavy cognitive load. Um, so is there a differentiation between the ways that these strategies could be implemented depending on where a person is in their- Yeah, definitely. And I think, I mean, I, I often um, am seen as clini crit criticizing clinicians and therapists, but I think there are some, there are some remarkable therapists out there, some really skilled therapists. I've been very impressed by many therapists as well. And I think a good therapist know, you know, has an intuition about what to, when to ask things and when not to. I think with people who are really struggling with a lot, you know, with serious difficulties, like depressed people, I mean, seriously depressed people or highly anxious people, that's much, that's a very hard, um, um, it's a very hard road to hoe. It's a very hard situation to be in, and it's very hard to to um, to make one's way out of it. And I think that um, the research we have—I don't know if we have enough research on this. There's always need to do more research, but we've seen in the research that some people who are, say, um, you know, seriously depressed would meet the diagnostic criteria for depression. Some of those people are still flexible, and we've done some longitudinal studies, you know, over time. Well, we've seen that the people who like score high in whatever way we can measure flexibility are more likely to, to, um, to remit, to, to go back into the less depressed state compared to people who don't. That's, there's not the only way things work. Of course, there are lots of different factors involved, but even among people who are struggling, some of those people can, can engage in these processes and some can't. Some need other kinds of help. So I think a good clinician would really have to tease that apart and, you know, test the waters a little bit. And the rah-rah part, I mean, that's also, I think, doesn't quite work, you know, like, you know, just being too encouraging because that can also feel offensive to the person who hears it. Like, you know, you know, what do you know? Why are you telling me to get over this? Or, you know, so I think it's more basic of asking people questions about what they have at their disposal. And I think the, the mindset part that's harder to work on unless you're in a more normative state, right? A, a more quiet state. But the sequence of behaviors, you know, I have several colleagues who are using these, this, the sequence part, the different like tools to, or the different approach to, uh, to solving what they need to do situation by situation. I have several colleagues who are therapists and, you know, in, in pretty high stress contexts who use it with their patients. And they've told me about it and asked me about it. Um, I mentioned some of those examples in the book. Um, people, one friend works in a cancer hospital, another friend works with, um, uh, with a, a population of people who are um, trying to care for a loved one who's dying, right? So, but there's, of course, other contexts as well, um, like say the military or something like that, where there's a lot of stressors and, to deal with at the time. And it's possible then to, to sort of teach people some of these, 
these concepts and they can use them. And the, generally the response has been pretty favorable. You know, um, it, it, I think everything needs to be taken with a grain of salt. You know um, that you know this may this is likely to work for you, but you know give it a try. And I always think of it giving it a try. You know, try it on for size. That's, that sounds like that's where the clinical world comes to the rescue, where you can have um, as long as people are speaking the same language in terms of what can work for a person. Yeah, um, the clinician themselves, any clinician worth uh, his or her weight in salt, would be able to prioritize what the un, whatever unmet needs are. So if the if really the problem is you can't even get somebody to think you know, rationally or coherently, then that would be obviously uh, tier one of your relationship with them. So yeah. Not- and I think, I think that in that case, the, the clinician may, I mean, I'm, I'm just speaking somewhat off the top of my head here, but the clinician may benefit by trying some of these things without, you know, instructing the person, but doing mm-hmm. that for them. You know, one of my colleagues though, I think I've mentioned this in the book, but it, I, I'm pretty sure it's in the book. Um, I'm not a fan of, you know, giving people kind of, here's a list of coping behaviors, right? right? But she was doing this with patients and I asked her about that, you know, somewhat critically. And she said, you know, when people are really stressed out and they're coping with something really difficult, it's hard to think, what can I do here? And then often when people say, I have nothing else to do. I can't do anything else. So I give them a list because it gives them ideas and they can mm-hmm. look at the list and think, well, yeah, I can do that and I can do that. So I think a therapist can also walk people who are really struggling through some of these pieces by asking them the questions for them. Well, what's happening here? You know, what is the problem you're struggling with? What do you have at your disposal? What do you need to do here? What could you do here? What, what tools do you have? You know, asking them those questions and they, they may answer them or may not, you know, they might, they, but it, the therapist can help them work it out, help them think about it. And in fact, Another um, colleague of mine told me an example where um, a patient was really struggling with something and the, the, the person, they were struggling and they were finding kind of their way to some solutions and they, they began working with a, a mental health professional who then provided them with lots of other possibilities that they could try kind of with an open mind, like give this a try, see if it works. And that was extremely helpful. You know, it's the idea that you can, you know, try it, try it on for size and see if it works. And if it doesn't work, try something else. I agree. I agree with that. You know, I, it seems like that makes sense. If you, if so much is competing for your attention that you can't even wrap your arms around a concept to try, then yeah, why not offer? Um, so I, we've already talked about you've this line of work, but you personally and your ideas have received pushback. Um what do you do to counteract the, um, I don't know, the, what would you call it? The gurus of trauma theory, people who are, you know, making this uh, rhetorically famous uh, claim that, you know, trauma is something and something within you. Um, And what what are some examples of pushback that you've gotten, or maybe even heated pushback you've gotten? Well, earlier in my career, you know, I was a younger person. Um, I didn't have any gray hair, you know, and I was, I look, I've been told I always looked young. So when I was younger, I looked really young, you know, almost juvenile. And that, you know, professionally that may have worked against me, but I came out, I started publishing these papers, presenting these ideas. And the the response I had, they were published in my papers, my, 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 papers about the work I was doing, the research papers and the theoretical papers were published in pretty good journals, but they had no response. You know, they were, they just fell like lead balloons. And that was the, basically the professional community, the sort of, I think, traditional trauma community ignored them, both the bereavement community and the trauma community. So my response to that was, you know, I really thought I'm on this one, so I just kept doing it. I kept, put my nose to the ground, you know, I went to conferences sometimes feeling anonymous because I think people, no one told me, but I think people were thinking, well, there's that guy who does that stuff. And I was a little bit baffled by that, but, you know, um, and I'd been also told some pretty harsh things early on, but that was more rare. It was more being ignored, which hurts, you know, but I, I, I took it in stride and I, you know, I kept doing the work I do because I love, you know, I love puzzle solving. I love doing the research I do. I love playing with ideas. So that was to me, rewarding enough, I kept doing it. As the work began to pile up, it began to catch on. And, um, and then eventually it started becoming quite, uh, quite well known. And I've been later in my career, I've gotten, you know, lifetime awards and things, you know, I think the gray hair comes in handy for that to get a lifetime award. 
Um, but I've met up with some of those uh, those traditional trauma researchers, people at conferences and things, and they do this curious thing now where they reach out to shake my hand and, and I begin to pull it away. <laughs> they begin to pull their hand away because I think they're they have to accept that my work has had an impact and that I write basically about many of these things, but they're still not thrilled with it. And that's fine with me, you know. I mean, I, you know, that is what it is. I don't take a lot of this personally. Um, but it, you know, so I think being ignored initially was the difficult thing. And I still get the, you know, as much as my work is caught on and it's been accepted, I still get the, 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 the occasional, uh, person, often a, a mental health professional, even some researchers will just tell me, you know, in, in, in no uncertain terms, you're just wrong about that. It can't be true. You're just wrong. It's some hocus pocus of your research, especially now, early on, I used whatever tools I had. Now, as in the last 10 or I'd say 10 years now, maybe a little longer, we started using advanced computational models to demonstrate some of this stuff. And I'm a big fan of that. We use machine learning. We do all kinds of other things where we actually find the same, we find more or less what we've continued to find, but now in a much more sophisticated way. And I think anyone who doesn't want to believe it will then look to those that approach and say, well, that's some sort of statistical trick you're doing to get these findings. And there are still plenty of people who don't believe it, but I think um, the surprising thing for me, and I may have mentioned this earlier, is that um, I get openly criticized more than I used to. And I think that's because the work has caught on. So I think it's fair game, you know, to, mm. to take pot shots, you know, and, um, and that's okay too. That hurts in a different way. You know, all these things hurt a little bit, but you know, I think if somebody wants to be enormously popular or wealthy, either of those things, they should not become an, uh, a research professor, you know, because <laughs> you don't, you don't get either of those things, you know, academics are, you know, academic researchers are, you know, they're, you get a little bit of recognition and that's it, you know, the, the you know, um, I think once I was called down to CNN to be on their news desk for some event that happened, and they sent a limo to pick me up because I live right in New York, right? So they could get me over to CNN, which is also right in New York. And on the way down, the limo driver said to me, what do you do? And I said, I'm a psychologist. And he said, oh, guess who I had in my car just a month ago? Dr. Phil, you know, and, <laughs> and no offense to anyone who follows Dr. Phil, but he's not much, doesn't have much credential, right? And um, that was to me, he was saying, I had a real famous one in my car, you know? Yeah, so, if, you know, okay. yeah. if anybody wants that, don't become a, a research, don't become a professor because it doesn't come very easily. Um, I'm gonna juxtapose again. The, the theories that Peel has put forward and I've now followed doing in, in addiction, um, people have come to grapple with. I mean, he's been doing this for half a century. I've been doing it for maybe the past 10 years, but uh, people have had to reconcile the fact that people overcome addictions that drugs themselves are not the sole uh are not the center of addiction there's nothing living inside a drug that you know creates a draw a physical draw and people can kind of say that like okay yeah we've gotten over those theories and it seems like as progress has made those findings um well it all the new way of thinking about things just becomes assimilated into the standard addiction boxes and I, I wonder if you think the same thing, I work in school systems too. And I um, wonder if you think the same thing about trauma theory versus resilience research. Like I recently, <clears throat> someone gave a presentation about how people are much more resilient than we've been giving them credit for and there are ways to promote this. And so, uh, you know, an entire staff, an entire school district watched this and thought, well, this is great. And then we went back to, uh, yeah. you know, tra trauma informed practice and everything else that we do. We just, yeah. you know, now we have the credential that we have the CEUs or whatever that says, well, we did this yes. resilience training. Um, how do you suppose you counteract that? Like well, more data or more or something a little more nuanced than that? Um, that's a great question. I think it's, it is, you're absolutely correct. It does happen and it has happened with even the work I've done so that um, the, the, the trauma world is focused on PTSD. And then when resilience became popular, so many people in the trauma world simply started talking about people who don't get, equating resilience with people who don't get PTSD. And so that's actually no change at all. 
Hmm. Right. Because because uh, when we have just PTSD, we still know that there are people who don't get PTSD. Now they're calling them resilient. And that's actually not accurate. It's not what we do in, our, in my own research. We actually follow different patterns over time. We find that there's there's a chronic symptom trajectory like PTSD. But then there's another pattern of people who struggle for with a lot of symptoms, maybe elevated PTSD symptoms, maybe even a diagnosis for only a few months. And then they gradually get better. It might take a year or two for them to get all the way back down to like perfect health again, or no, let's say, say the health that they were at before, baseline. And that's a pattern we call recovery. And then there's a third pattern of people who's kind of right in the middle somewhere. They have some symptoms. They're not doing that well after the event, but they're able to do their you know, job and they'll be close to other people and forget about it for a while. But over time, they slowly get worse. And that's a kind of a delayed pattern. It's not sudden, it's gradual, and then they just keep getting worse. And there are lots of fat reasons why that might happen. Each one of those patterns is still a pretty small percentage. And then you have the resilience trajectory, which is people who are pretty much healthy from the get-go, except for a little bit of blurp it, blip, blip in the beginning. But those are four different patterns. And there are sometimes we've identified either other patterns. Every, every data set, every event is different. So the, but that gets completely ignored. And um, the, the, the simulation was to say it's trauma or resilience, risk and resilience factors. And, you know, that's the same word that was around before. And it's kind of like just put the ideas into the same boxes, as you said. And, you know, I've published papers, you know, making this very point and arguing, you know, within the, within the professional community. And I've had some people get very angry at me because I, I, I'm usually not afraid for my own for better or worse, I'm not afraid to name names or to cite people as making the mistake. And people tend to get really angry about that. Mm. Like, well, you know, I don't take this personally and you shouldn't take it personally either. Maybe I'm a little bit too extreme in that way. But, you know, I think there is that, that, that inertia that does happen. It's like a, like a black hole that, you know, the, the dominant theory, and this is, you know, the philosophy of science shows that this is how it works, actually. We, we have, when we have a, a theoretical frame, uh, for anything. We have a model, a roadmap. We're going to put everything into that roadmap until it breaks, you know, and that's just what we do. So eventually, you know, the, the traditional idea breaks. And that's partly what my book was about. It's basically saying, look, it's kind of broken already. But also, you know, it's what my work has been about. So I've just kept doing it for 30 years. And it has had, to some extent, caught on now. You know, there are people who talk about these trajectories now. And, you know, and, and that's very satisfying. But it's still it's hard to it's hard to get out of those boxes. We cling to those boxes. That's sort of like a, a sunk cost kind of a fallacy, but yeah, it could be yeah. you have inside your in your theory. Yeah, nice way. Do, to put it, yeah. Do, are, do you are you aware of anybody who who believes your research but acts as though they believe the opposite? Yeah, sure. Actually, one of the best examples of that is I've argued over and over and over in various publications, and often when I give lectures that you can't measure resilience with a questionnaire. It's mm. just not one thing. You can't give people a questionnaire and say, oh, look, you scored high on this questionnaire, you are resilient. It's just a complete fallacy. And there's actually in, um, it, they actually published a paper recently just reviewing the studies that have looked at that. So when you give people a resilience questionnaire, it usually correlates with health. That's because if you're healthy and you get, I give you a resilience questionnaire, and you say, oh, yeah, sure, that's me. You know, that's a really common thing that would happen. But if, but those resilience questionnaires have not been able, no one's been able to show that they actually predict who will be resilient at all. And sometimes it goes the opposite direction. And so that's, you know, there's, there's, ne there's not a single piece of evidence giving someone one of those questionnaires will predict that who, if they will be resilient. It just doesn't happen. And I don't think it will ever happen. But those questionnaires are enormously popular. People will read my work and say, and, and really, you know, think I'm going to write him a letter and say, I'm starting to do research and say, I've read your papers, fantastic. Which resilience questionnaire would you, met, would you suggest I use? And, mm. you know, that just, because it's, I think it's really hard for people not to think that way. And I, you know, I, I try to be sympathetic. It's because we're human and we, we, as humans, we, we make these mistakes all the time. And I'm sure I make mountains of mistakes about fields I don't know as much about, you know, that I do the same thing. I just assume traditional models, you know, and I have a very close friend who I, I think is the most brilliant person I've ever met named Lisa Feldman Barrett. 
She um, recently wrote a book about the brain, the seven and a half lessons about the brain. She wrote a great book about emotion. And I was talking with her, she's just enormously smart. And I mentioned the stress response system to her. And she said to me, it's not a system. <laughs> and I thought, oh, I guess you're absolutely right. It's just a collection of processes that, that are not organized into a system. It's just different. Pro and I thought, wow, you're right. But I just kept thinking of it that same way, you know. And I mean, there are lots of other examples, maybe a little not so subtle, but yeah, it's it's just human to do that. That's a really good way of putting it because now I'm I'm thinking about all the times that I've used those kind of heuristics and probably made myself look like an idiot in front of experts and some. <laughs> Yes. Well, I mean, I read a lot of books. I read a lot of nonfiction books on topics outside my field because I'm entertained by them and I learn something. But, you know, who knows how much I take home with me and how much I just put in whatever boxes I have, you know, because it's, right. it's how our minds work. Um, so what's next for you? Uh, what do you hope to explore, discover, disprove uh, in the future? Well, gosh, that's a great question. I think when I write a book for the general public, kind of broad audience book, I take more chances and I, I kind of use it to summarize my thinking. And that's exactly what I did with this book, The, the End of Trauma. You know, I, I, I kind of pulled everything together I've been working on and did it to a, like a larger picture. And that has a way of freeing me in a sense from, from my own boxes in a sense. And so I'm beginning now to, I'm continuing to do research with my lab, my doctoral students and postdocs in my lab and with colleagues all over the world, basically. And we're beginning to just try to think, how can we take this further? I'm very interested in that. That's one thing I'm doing. And, you know, so the flexibility mindset and sequence, there are a lot of moving parts there. So I'm trying to now figure out better ways to understand that. We're doing machine learning, as I mentioned. So there must be a way that I can get at this and even closer look at it and see like, un get in a little like, so inside under the hood with it and really watch what's happening and see what is, what is, what needs, where it can go from here. That's one thing I'm doing. I'm also beginning to think about, you know, other areas that I can begin to explore. Um, there are some things that I've always wanted to explore. I probably never will like prisons because mm. prisons don't work in our country. And I'd love to try to work out why, but it's, that's a big topic. Um, you know, so there, there's some other things like that. I mean, I thought about just this morning, I was out running and I thought, why is Buddhism so hard, you know, in, in, in the Western world? And um, I've, you know, I've meditated for years and I've read a lot of Buddhism and it just, I just can't make it work. And then I thought, you know, it, when I know, I know a lot about modern psychology and modern psychology is not perfectly compatible with Buddhism. For example, I love to double task. I love to double task. I'm very happy double tasking. And in the Buddhist world, that's not a good thing to be doing, right? Mm -hmm. And so, but I thought, but it's great. I get a lot done and it makes me happy. So, you know, I was thinking about go exploring that in the book, but who knows? I don't know. I mean, I'll basically go, you know, I'll, 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 I'll do what I really enjoy, which is playing around with ideas and researching. And when something makes clear to me, I'll, I'll take that further. Now I can't help it. That was going to be the last question, but you did mention, and I thought it was funny about uh, mindfulness in the book. Of course, you talk about mindfulness as something um, that is good to practice. I mean, it's just an overall good to be more aware, noticing more. Um, but for some people that can actually have detrimental effects, uh, at least maybe you, maybe I'm using the words mindfulness and meditation interchangeably. Yeah. I mean, they tend to be used interchangeably, but I think mindfulness meditation is a good way to work that out, but mm -hmm. I definitely, meditation or the practice of mindfulness is a very good thing to do. There's lots and lots of evidence for it. There's lots of health benefits and psychological benefits, but it's not a cure-all. And when, when really highly aversive things happen, like a potentially traumatic event, it's a challenging thing. And it puts our, puts us through some, puts us our mind through some, some very difficult periods. And, you know, we can be very anxious. We can be, um, you know, have a high state of physiological arousal. We can be having nightmares and mindfulness and meditation aren't necessarily going to help there for everybody at least. And they can, as you said, be somewhat harmful. And there are enough people within that field who point this out that I, I felt it was, it was, I was confident in mentioning that in the book, you know, when people are highly anxious, focusing inward doesn't always what what helps them sometimes distraction is what helps them plain old simple you know give me a beer in a, in a movie distraction is sometimes you know 
the best thing or, you know, give yourself a break, you know, and I think the demands of mindfulness can be, some people feel them, experience them as difficult. And so I think it's not a panacea. That was mostly the point I wanted to make. It's not a panacea. And so don't assume it is. And there are plenty of, it's one of the tools you have. I know from a Buddhist perspective, a Buddhist perspective would say it's not just a tool, but then, you know, that's an entire worldview and that may be what, what person has or not. You know, I, here's, I, was, I spent um, um, four, four days, I think, at the, uh, in, in Santa Fe at the, um, in Joan Halifax's wonderful retreat. She's a brilliant person. She's, a, I think, a prominent Buddhist, and she's just a hugely impressive person. But then that monastery, the Buddhist monastery, I gave a talk at part of this series on mind and brain. They, um, they eat mindfully. They don't talk during their, their meal. And I was sitting next to a guy who's Greek and we started whispering to each other, there's something wrong here, right? Talking and eating is the best thing because we're both Mediterranean. I have a Sicilian background. And you're talking and eating, you know, and the whole event is, is just wonderful. So I couldn't quite get on board with it. You know, I mean, that's, I guess, mm. kind of an odd twist of, along that anecdote. But it's a, one of the examples that came to mind. No, it makes, it makes the point. Maybe that's one of the reasons why it's so hard in the West to, uh, to adopt that whole lifestyle yeah. yeah well this is all fascinating thank you so much for taking time to do this i i couldn't help reach out after uh, uh going through the book and just, yeah zach thanks very much it was really nice to meet you and nice to have the really nice conversation i appreciate it